lecture today is going to start by trying to answer a very simple question. And that is, do Carnot engines work in a way that represent a real engine? And the short answer is no. And it's because in a four stroke gasoline engine, the process usually begins by taking in gasoline, which vaporizes, and then oxygen into the cylinder. Then the cam closes where then we do a compression to high pressure, much lower specific volume. And then the third step is when the spark plug ignites, at least for a light duty passenger vehicle, um, there's a spark plug for a diesel engine, there isn't. And we'll talk about diesel engines a little bit um, later on in the semester. But after the spark plug ignites, it ignites the, the gas mixture. And of course we have a combustion. And that combustion is extremely fast. And as we've said before, it's on the order of millisecond. After the combustion occurs, the piston's forced in the opposite direction, right? It's forced to expand. And then after the expansion happens, we open the cam, gases come back down, where then they are exhausted. And then as the cam's still open, when the cylinder goes back up, you take in fresh gasoline and air, and that's just the intake step, right? And and so in a process like this, the heat is actually added, not as a Carnot cycle would in contact with some hot reservoir, but it happens from the reaction of a fuel. Now we're gonna end up modeling this cycle as a closed system without combustion. The, actually taking the combustion into consideration is much, much more complicated, but we're gonna add it in this step and it's gonna happen fast. And fast in our case is gonna mean essentially the volume doesn't change during the heating step. And then finally, the exhaust stage is where we lose heat because gases are still hot when we remove them from the cylinder and we intake fresh gas. So this stage is gonna be heat that we add and this state is gonna be heat removed. And as we go through the cycle, we're gonna treat the exhaust and intake as, um, as single steps. Okay, or as a single step. And if we think about it that way, it allows us maybe to start to put together the simplifications that we can use to mathematically describe what happens, right? Using all of the equations that we have developed during the course of this semester. So one of the things that we know is that when we take in this fluid, that this is going to be somewhere near atmospheric pressure and the cylinder is at its largest point, right? And so this intake and exhaust step, which we've already said we're kind of combining into one step, is going to give us the gas at the lowest pressure, lowest temperature, and the highest specific volume, right? Because we haven't done a compression yet. And oftentimes the lowest pressure is actually at STP or at, at one atmosphere. And then when we do the compression, well, the most straightforward simplification that we can do here is assume that it is reversible and adiabatic, which of course we know that that's code for isentropic. If our combustion is very, very fast, this means that the change in the specific volume is essentially zero, or we can assume that it's zero. Our expansion in step four is also gonna be reversible and adiabatic. Right? And we also can assume that this exhaust and intake step happens very, very quickly as well. 
So the change in the specific volume is approximately equal to zero. And that's not bad because the step from going to where you exhaust the gas, right? Where you push it all out to then when you go back to the intake, the cylinder has gone all the way down and all the way back up. So effectively the specific volume is the same. And if we do this, we can draw the same two diagrams for this cycle as we did for the Carnot. And this is called the Otto cycle. And it basically is our four stroke automotive engine. Or at least closely resembles it. So let's draw those two diagrams. One is of course the PV diagram, which we're reasonably familiar with. And the other one is the TS diagram, which we really just started to talk about in our previous lecture. And because we're more comfortable with a PV diagram, let's start there. And we know at the end of step five and one, the exhaust and intake step, we're at the lowest temperature pressure and highest specific volume. So I'm gonna draw that here, all right? And so after the intake has occurred, we're gonna do step two, which is the compression. And if this reversible and adiabatic, we know that the pressure and the temperature should both go up. So on this curve, we're gonna go here, right? And this line corresponds to step two. Then the third step is combustion. So if this happens very, very quickly so that the change in the volume is equal to zero, all that's gonna happen is that the pressure and the temperature go up when the combustion occurs. So we're gonna go straight to here. And this is step three. Then we're gonna have the expansion step, which is also reversible and adiabatic. But remember, we have to end up at the same specific volume here at the end of step three. So here's our expansion in step four. And then finally, we have step five. So remember, step two is compression. Step three is combustion. Step four is expansion. And then step five, which really could be five plus one, is returning to the initial state, just like we did uh, for the Carnot cycle, right? Where we always return to the initial state. And just like we did when we evaluated the Carnot cycle, I'm gonna designate where we are in the cycle. So I'm gonna draw A, B, C, and D around the cycle, just clockwise, starting from the highest temperature pressure and the lowest specific volume. And now let's think then about where we are on our, um, on our TS diagram. So first of all, we're gonna have two isentropic stages, right? Where delta S is equal to zero because they're adiabatic and reversible. So step two and step four will be um, adiabatic reversible, right? So it'll be a vertical line here, but let's try to figure out where we are. So at the end of step five slash one, we are at the lowest temperature and pressure, which also means we'd be at the lowest entropy value. So if we're gonna be at the lowest temperature and the lowest entropy value of the process, actually we are starting here, right? After step five slash one or right before step two. And if that doesn't make any sense, let's think, well, we're here is where we're talking about. So this is actually C. And now if we do our compression, it's adiabatic and reversible. And we're going to higher temperature and pressure, right? So if we go to higher temperature isentropically, we're gonna go here from C to D. And that step, of course, is step two. And one of the things I wanna point out is remember when we did the Carnot cycle, 
Steps one, two, three, and four were all were on the same side of the TS diagram and the PV diagram, right? Step one was the bottom and the bottom here, but that's not the case in the auto cycle. They're offset. So step two is on the bottom. Step two is on the left, okay? So then in step three, we're gonna have combustion where both the temperature and pressure are going to increase significantly. And what that means, of course, is that the entropy is gonna increase as well. So we're gonna go from D here to what's labeled as A, okay? And then the expansion is also reversible and adiabatic, right? So that's gonna take us from A to B. And then finally, we have our return to the initial condition. So we're going this way, right back to step C. So this is step three. This is step four. And this is step five. Um, could you just uh, one more time compare and contrast the Carnot cycle and the Otto cycle? Just yeah. yeah, that's a good question. That's, a, that's actually a very good question, right? So let's look at this, right? So if we had the Carnot cycle, right? So first of all, our PV diagram looks significantly different that we have, if you remember in the Carnot cycle, there's two expansion steps and there's two, and there's two compression steps. So the TS diagram for the Carnot cycle looks like this, where we have T hot, T cold, and when we had, hey, let me draw this really quick and then we'll actually do this. One, two, three, four. So we called this in the Carnot cycle, step one, step two, step three, step four, right? And that's one, two, three, and four. So in the Carnot cycle, we end up starting the process with um, a removal of heat at constant temperature, right? Which is at T cold, which causes the specific volume to go down. So it's like an isothermal compression. Then in the second step, and the reason why I, call, I like to call this step two is because this step two and this step two are, very, are actually mechanically the same concept, right? We're doing an adiabatic reversible compression. We're doing work, right? So step two is work in here, right? So this is work in, this is Q out. Then step three was this transfer of heat at the hot temperature. So this is Q in, and then Step four in the Carnot cycle is um, where we actually get our expansion, which is work out, okay? And you can actually see here, we have something that is at least somewhat similar, right? So here we know for a fact that that is Q, that we do put, um, sorry, that this is gonna be our work in step. Step three is actually Q in. Step four here is actually work out. And step five is Q out. And you can see from the Carnot, it's actually just offset a little bit, but the numbering hopefully is helpful because the numbering is the same. Now, one of the interesting things here that isn't the case in the Carnot cycle is that the temperature is different at every stage. So remember in the Carnot cycle, we were able to perfectly separate when we um, did work and when heat was added and removed. But because these steps like step three and step one are not isothermal like they were in the Carnot cycle, we can't do that here. And so we actually have to think a little bit about what happened to the change. If you really want to be quantitative, what really happened to the change in um, 
what's happening to the change in the internal energy as well as heat and work for each of those steps um, individually. All right. So hopefully, hopefully that answers your question. Is that a little, a little more clear here? What the what the operational differences are between the two? Yeah, that helps. Thank you. Okay, no problem. All right, that was a very good question. So let's solve a problem then related to the auto cycle. And the place we want to get to eventually is understanding efficiency. And then we're going to want to compare that to the Carnot efficiency. So here, let me actually get rid of this and pose the question. So, so let's ask if the thing that we're going to call the beginning state, right, which is really the intake, right? So this is um, at point C, you know, of a fluid in the auto cycle is standard temperature and pressure. Let's find, we'll do the same thing we did for Carnot. So let's find the temperature, pressure, and the specific volume for air, right? So let's do that. Let's do the air auto cycle. After each step. And we are also going to um, find the efficiency. Now, we can't do that with the information that we have, right? With just this, we need a little bit more mechanical information. So the first one that we're gonna use is that our compression ratio, again, in step three is five to one, okay? All right, so that's the first thing that we're gonna use. And that the second or the maximum pressure that we can withstand in the process is equal to 45 atmospheres, okay? And from these two pieces of information, we should be able, knowing the initial condition and those two, find the state of the fluid at all of these other conditions. And then from there, we'll end up solving for the efficiency, okay? And if everybody's comfortable with that, I'm just gonna start. And so what we're gonna try to do now for the next you know, 15 minutes or so is to find the state of the fluid at D, A, and B, because we know that at C, right? Or at point C in our diagram, that the temperature equals 298.15 Kelvin. We know that the pressure is equal to one atmosphere. And we also know that the specific volume from the ideal gas equation of state is 24.5 liters per mole. So let's first try to calculate what's going on at state D. And we can do that because we know that step two is reversible and adiabatic. And as we said just a moment ago, that means that it's isentropic. And so delta S over R equals zero. But we know then that that's also equal to the integral from TC to TD of CV over R DT over T plus the natural log of the specific volume at D over the specific volume at C. And you'll notice that I use a different form of this equation than we typically would use. And it's because we actually know what the, um, what the ratio between these two volumes is, um, whereas we don't know the pressure. So that only leaves one unknown in this equation, right? And that's the temperature at D. So we know from the information here that this was specific volume at D, right? Equals VC over five which equals 4.89 liters per mole, right? It's 24.5 over five. And so we can then solve this equation. And we know then that zero equals 
And if CV is um, five halves R for a simple diatomic ideal gas, we know then that this becomes the integral from TC to TD of five halves R over R, DT over T plus the natural log of V sub D over V C. And so we get that five halves times the natural log of TD over TC plus the natural log of V sub D over V sub C is equal to zero. And then five halves times the natural log of TD over T sub C equals minus the natural log of V sub D over V sub C, which of course just equals the natural log of V sub C over V sub D. And we can solve then for D. So the temperature at D then is equal to TC times VC over V sub D to the two fifths. And that's just using the same math that we've done before where we use the, the rule of logs to bring the five halves up here then you take the exponent and then um, to get rid of the natural logs and then you raise everything to the two fifths. And so that means that T sub D equals TC, which is 298.15 K times VC over V sub D. And we know that our compression ratio was five to one. So this just becomes five to the two fifths. And so T, at D is then 567.6 Kelvin. And then the final state here that we need to know is the pressure at D, which of course is just equal to RTD over V sub D from the ideal gas equation of state, right? And we find then that that is 9.52 atmospheres. Okay. All right, so hopefully that feels okay, right? And that you guys uh, followed that pretty well. Yeah. Uh, I just want to double check. So the only reason you used the um, entropy balance with volume is just because we knew the, the ratio of the volumes. If we knew the ratio of the pressures, you would use the other one. Exactly. Yep, okay. absolutely. Yep, and as long as it's isentropic, right, we can do that. Yeah, good question. Okay, so now we've kind of taken care of step two, right? So we understand what's happening here. And, you know, now we actually have state C at the beginning, and now we have state D, which is after the compression. And if you look, the next thing that we have to talk about then is, is what happens in step three. But the interesting thing here is that in the given information in the problem, we know the pressure here, right? We actually know in, from step three that the pressure is 45 atmospheres after step three. And we also know that this step happens at constant volume. So we actually can then use the ideal gas law in step three to our advantage. Right, and we know that then the pressure here, right, at state A, which is the thing that we're gonna solve for now, that the pressure at A times specific volume at A divided by the pressure at D times the specific volume at D equals R times TA over R times T sub D. And the ideal gas constants cancel and the volumes are gonna cancel. And so that's gonna leave us that PA over PD equals TA over, over TD or that the temperature at A equals the temperature at D 
times the pressure at A over the pressure at D, right? And so T sub D, we just calculated, right? That was 567.6 Kelvin. And then the pressure at A, we know from the problem statement is 45 atmospheres. And the um, pressure at D was 9.52 atmospheres. And so now we can calculate the temperature of A is equal to 2,683 Kelvin, which is pretty warm, right? All right, so now we have, right, PA from the problem statement is 45 atmospheres. And we know again that this was constant, right? 4.89 liters per mole. And so we actually have, if I sort of zoom back out and go back to the problem statement here or the diagram, that now we know C, D, and A, okay? And from here, you could pick on either direction. You either could go from, C, from B to C because we know the state at C, right? So you could do that assessment or you could go from A to B, which is again, this adiabatic reversible expansion. And because the math, is exactly the same as what we already did for step um, for step two. I want to use um, the information we know to go from A to B. So in step four, right, we know again that delta S over R is equal to zero, right? And that's just the integral from TA to TB of CV over R DT over T plus the natural log of V sub B over VA. And remember that V sub B is just equal to V sub C because that return here is done at constant volume. And we know that V sub C was 24.5 liters per mole. Okay, and we can do the exact same math as we did um, for step two and find that TB is equal to TA times the specific volume of A over the specific vo volume at B raised to the two fifths. And so there's 2682 Kelvin, which we just calculated, then times the ratio of those specific volumes, which now, right, is just one over five raised to the two fifths. So we can find the temperature of B is then equal to 1409 Kelvin, okay? And now we can find the last thing is the pressure at B from the ideal gas law, which is just RTB over V sub B. And that is equal to 4.72 atmospheres. And so one of the things that we were able to do now is given a couple pieces of mechanical information about the process and the initial condition, we now know the thermodynamic state of the fluid, the temperature, the pressure, and the specific volume everywhere inside of, of the cycle, okay, in this auto cycle. The very last thing in this problem is to evaluate the efficiency, okay? And we talked in the last lecture about why efficiency is important and about um, its role in understanding sort of energy conversion in general. So we're gonna calculate the efficiency of every cycle and then we'll, we will compare them all to the Carnot efficiency that we do this semester. And so, the efficiency here of the auto cycle is actually the same as the definition as it was in the Carnot cycle, that it's minus the net amount of work that's done divided by the heat that we add to the system. And so here, 
that's minus the net amount of work that's done divided by the heat in step three, okay? And if you remember from our previous conversations about the Carnot cycle, that for a cycle, delta u, right, the sum of delta u equals the sum of the heat steps plus the sum of the work steps. But of course, that's equal to zero. So that means then that this minus net amount of work, which is the sum of the work terms, really just equals the sum of the heat terms in the process. And in the auto cycle, there are only two stages where heat is added or removed. And one of those is in step three, when we purposely add heat, usually through combustion, right? So that's Q3. And the other step where we have heat exchange is when you exhaust the gas and intake the new gas because you dump hot gas out into the atmosphere. So that is Q5. But none of the other steps exchange heat at all. And so that means that our efficiency for the auto cycle, as we've started to look at it, is just equal to Q3 plus Q5 divided by Q3, okay? And so now what we need to do is evaluate the heat terms between, um, for these steps at um, Q3 and Q5. And so if we look at step three and step five, those are both done at constant volume. And that's really important because for both of these, what that means is that each step individually is bound by Q and W, right? Delta or by the first law where Q or delta U is equal to Q plus W. Well, in a system where it's reversible uh, or at constant volume and reversible, right? That is equal to zero because this, right, is PDV. And so that means that for steps three and five, that Q is equal to delta U. And of course, we know that the change in the internal energy is just the integral from T1 to T2 of CV dt, right? So that means that the efficiency of our auto cycle just equals Q3 plus Q5 over Q3. So in step three, we are going between, if we scroll up just a little bit, step three, we're going from D to A, right? So our auto efficiency is the integral from TD to TA of CV dt, then this is plus the integral for step five, which is TB to TC of CV dt divided by Q3, which again was the integral from TD to TA of CV dt. And if our heat capacity is equal to a constant, which we would expect it to be if we're assuming that it's a simple ideal gas. This means that that's just CV times TA minus TD plus CV times TC minus TB over CV times TA minus TD. And the heat capacity terms are constant, so those are going to go away. 
And we're going to divide through by T A minus, um, or actually, we're just going to separate these, right? And so that means the efficiency of our auto cycle just becomes equal to one, right? This TA minus TD over TA minus TD is equal to one plus TC minus TB over TA minus TD. Now, some people don't like this because it looks like, it looks like the efficiency could be greater than one, but this is always going to be a negative number. And so what people do instead is they re-derive this expression. They call it one minus TB minus TC over TA minus TD. And that is the efficiency of the auto cycle. And for our specific problem, we can input the numbers where we know that TB was 1408 Kelvin. We know that TC is the inlet, so that was 298.15 Kelvin, divided by TA, which is the hottest temperature, which was 2683 Kelvin, minus TD, which was 567.6 Kelvin. And for our example problem, the efficiency of the auto cycle was 47%. Okay. Now, the last question that we're going to ask is how it compares to the Carnot efficiency. And the way we're going to do that is that that's one minus T cold over T hot. And if you're going to do this, the best efficiency you ever could have is the coldest temperature and the warmest temperature. So that's one minus 298.15 divided by 2683 Kelvin. And so if you were to look at the Carnot efficiency for this process, that would be 0 0.88. And you'll see that the actual efficiency of this auto cycle is less than the Carnot efficiency. And that's exactly what you would expect. <laughs>